Welcome back, my friends, to an intriguing week. We have got so many great things to finally dive deeper into around Starbase and Starship updates. We've got Falcon 9 action as always, and also, what is this? Looks like we are finally getting ready for action and another brand new rocket preparing to take its first flight. Yeah, I've got a bunch to cover today. Hey, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. <laughs> Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and there is just so much to catch up on at SpaceX's Starship launch site at Boca Chica. Remember last week I talked about the removal of several linkage arms as well as booster hold down clamps on the launch mount. As shown beautifully in this older render by Ryan Hansen Space, these arms allow the hold down clamps to extend and contract and form the platform for the booster to sit on. Well, the reinstallation of those was underway again with most, if not all of them, lifted back in. Now, if we compare the linkage arms that were removed to the new ones being installed, it does look like there were some slight modifications. Hopefully with those they won't need to be swapped out again in the near future. The new booster quick disconnect hood has also been reinstalled and tested already too. With that back on, we can more clearly see the difference between the new one and the old one taken away a little over a week ago. Interestingly, the middle part of the hood itself was again removed, and right after that, one of the cryogenic hoses has been taken away. I'm wondering if perhaps they assembled this well enough just for the static fire of Booster 11, and now they want to install a more robust system for the future. Continuing on with the trend of reinstalling things, we had a tower arm hydraulic actuator being taken away a little over a week ago, and its replacement has already been lifted back up. Last weekend, the team connected it up to all of the lines, and there we have it, all reinstalled. Now, there has been some speculation going around saying that this is an upgrade that must be required to perform a booster catch, but given that this is the only one that has been replaced so far, it isn't clear. Another may be on the way. As shared in last week's Starship presentation, if Flight 4 goes well, they may even attempt a catch with the tower with Flight 5, so some early preparations in advance of that would make some sense right now. Speaking of that catch, if SpaceX has a situation similar to that of Flight 3 where some of the control wiring was just ripped straight off the arms during the liftoff, there will certainly be no catching attempt. In fact, to solve that problem, we can already see shielding parts being installed on one of the chopstick stabilizers arms. Let's hope the theme there continues and everything gets nicely shielded up to withstand the mighty roar of the super heavy exhaust. With that arm moving under its own power, I suspect they were performing calibration testing here to verify that it's all ready to go. The addition of new concrete to the launch site is still underway, and the side of the main berm between the vertical tanks is at last being covered up. This part has been uncovered going back as far as the creation of the berm itself. Given that they've also replaced some of the HESCO barriers a while back with concrete, everything is starting to look smooth now. Last week I talked briefly about the new concrete wall going up right next to Highway 4, but to make it super clear, the old offload area right next to the vertical tanks is still fully visible. So is the main entrance to the launch site. The concrete wall is actually mainly in front of the newer horizontal tanks, starting from the methane tank, continuing up to the nitrogen tanks. Now speaking of, I need to catch you up on some of the more recent additions. Just as a bit of context, when they start feeding the propellants out of the tanks, they obviously need to replace that volume as the propellant flows out. There's multiple ways to do this, but the main one is by using the ambient air to heat up a fairly small amount of cryogenic liquid inside the pipes, converting it to its gas form. They then simply feed that gas back into the tanks as they empty out. For that, the most common way is to use vaporizers, and three new ones have appeared right next to two installed buffer tanks. Yes, SpaceX is starting to move away from just using the water heat exchange system inside the fluids bunker. Well, for the liquid oxygen side of the propellant farm at least. They do still need water for the liquid methane side though. That is where these five new small tanks close to the vertical tanks could come in. Now, keep in mind that there is also multiple vaporizers hidden away beneath the four liquid nitrogen tanks and the five liquid oxygen tanks. These I suspect are there to make sure that the liquid nitrogen tanks are pressurized correctly. So there is actually another four vaporizers laying close by, but their purpose we aren't actually certain of. They will probably be plumbed in right after the fourth flight. 
Do you know what isn't going to wait until the fourth flight? Yes, these two tanks. SpaceX looks to be going full steam ahead with disconnecting the lights and even marking the two vertical tanks that were reinforced before the third flight. One of those, of course, is currently a water tank and the other is one of the two liquid nitrogen tanks. From this activity, we can assume that the new horizontal liquid nitrogen storage tanks have been certified and at least partially filled already. Starship Gazer was out there as the SpaceX team spread gravel over the concrete and soon prepared cribbing so that the crane could safely remove those shells. It seems that SpaceX went to all of that effort to install the external bracing and paint over it all just for Flight 3. The crane picked up the load spreader, quickly hooked it up to the old repurposed water tank, and it was lifted off the stand, revealing the shiny inner tank underneath. Just like we saw with the first two shells, the crew were slicing it up into small pieces in no time. Okay, moving over to the old suborbital side, we can see quite drastic changes here. Thanks to the help from RGV aerial photography, we can now see that SpaceX did indeed end up getting the necessary paperwork all finished up to use this small strip of land that was in question. The grade of that bit of land there is being brought right up to the same level as everything else, and we should also get to see drainage wicks being added in this area too. All of this land we still believe is being prepared for the second tower foundation work to kick off in the near future. Over at the build site, Ship 29's tile installation work continues slowly but smoothly. SpaceX have also been removing a bunch of them around the forward flap area. Again, we think that this is due to them wanting to try something new with a steel surface or adhesives for intricate areas where they are stuck down in this method. Close by, the Star Factory is getting polished right up now with loads of the black cladding on the side facing Highway 4 being finalised. The scrapping of Booster 4 remains a thing. At least 13 of its Raptor engines have been removed and simply placed down on the concrete to presumably be discarded. Now heading over to the Massey's test site, there is just so much to cover here. The ship engine testing pad looks really different to what it did a few weeks ago. The main flame trench has been pretty much dug out completely it seems, and the pipework leading towards the water cooled flame deflector is being laid down. In fact, we can already see that the pipework is being fed in from the exhaust side of the trench. What's interesting is that just like the launch site's deluge plate system, this design seems to be made up of two separate pipes being laid down, most likely one for the centre part of the deflector, and the other pipe is probably divided and fed into the two side parts. I'm hoping, as I'm sure we all are, that SpaceX are going to share many videos and images of the static fire events once they are kicking off here. It is, after all, critical to have a super robust flame trench when the Starship has another three vacuum engines included, especially when you consider that those plus future Raptor upgrades will mean over double the thrust of the current ship. Over here we have the ship quick disconnect assembly which has also been lifted over and we've got some excellent views of the ship quick disconnect plate. The design actually looks to be fairly similar to that already in use at the launch site but they have given the system enough flexibility in all three axes to precisely line itself up to the ship with the installed linear rails. The main ramp that is going to allow the transporters to roll the ship up onto the flame trench is taking shape, but how do you roll it onto the main platform without it just falling into the exhaust area? Well, with a very strongly reinforced floor that can slide back and forth. They are creating this right here, and it looks like it just needs a layer of concrete on top. We believe the idea is for the transporters to roll the ship onto that floor, place the ship down, and then the floor would simply slide away to get ready for a static fire. Some of the support pieces have started being lifted as seen thanks to Lab Padre's camera views out there. Yes, it looks like the Massey's test site will be ready to support ship testing later on in the year, perhaps even by late summer if progress keeps kicking along like this. Now, I had a bunch of you in the comments asking a very good question last week. Why did SpaceX just casually drop that the latest Starship is only capable of delivering 40 to 50 tonnes into orbit, when for years we've been hearing that it is designed for delivering 100 to 150? Yeah, it's kind of the elephant in the room, isn't it? Is it because the dry mass of the Starship is a lot higher than they currently want it to be? That the engines are not as efficient or as powerful as they want? Well, you have all shared a lot of opinions. Interestingly, the total thrust listed on this slide is quite a chunk lower than what has been shown on the SpaceX website for quite some time now. 
If you looked close, you would have noticed that there is 460 tons of thrust missing there on the booster, and 250 missing on the upper stage Starship. That means that the 230 tons of thrust shown on the website, or even higher for the vacuum engines, does not match Flight Test 3 very closely at all. Does this mean that the Raptor 2 engines were underperforming? Was it always intended that maybe these numbers wouldn't be achievable until Starship version 2 and Raptor 3? Or is it simply that SpaceX decided to run these engines at a more conservative maximum thrust to minimise the chance of mishaps in the initial flights? Well, we don't know, but what we do know is that the Raptor engine is a huge challenge due to its complexity. More on that shortly, but first a big thanks to Delete Me sponsoring today's video. Your data is super valuable, and personal information is a huge asset for data brokers. These entities harvest your data and trade it with companies far and wide. This poses a considerable threat to your privacy, especially if it ends up in the hands of scammers. After I set it up, Delete Me scanned hundreds of data brokers for my information over the course of a few months, and not only did they find and remove the initial information found, but since then more has been found and cleaned. It's worth noting that Delete Me just took things to a new level. They've rolled out this awesome new feature that lets you bring your whole family under your Delete Me account. That means that everybody from your siblings to your grandmother can get the same level of protection. With easy to use controls, the account owner can manage privacy settings for the entire family in one place. You just assign a unique data sheet to each family member, all tailored to their specific online footprint, and then that means personalized and effective removal of their information. Their data sheets can also be set to private too, making them inaccessible to the account owner. In the end, it is all about keeping your family's data private. Delete Me can zero in on exactly what to clean up for each person, and you can rest easy knowing that everybody is a lot safer from a lot of the scams and spam out there. Since I've been using it, I've been getting way less nuisance calls and emails than I was before, so it certainly seems to be working for me. Give it a try using my link, joindeleteme.com slash Marcus, for a 20% discount on US consumer plans. You can also check out the URL for the international plans in the description of the video. Video. Privacy is a choice, not just for yourself, but your whole family too. Thank you, Delete Me. Okay, so SpaceX's Raptor engine is a huge challenge. Remember that new ground is being broken with this all the time, and it's a world first on a few fronts. It's been designed to be highly reusable, efficient, and use propellants that can be generated on Mars. Callum here has spent a bunch of time helping us illustrate this, which has been amazing. Raptor is a liquid engine, and it takes in its methane and oxygen propellant in cryogenic liquid form. That isn't overly unique by itself, but this is a full flow staged combustion engine. Lots of other engines, such as SpaceX's Merlin, use a much simpler gas generator setup. That simply burns some of the propellant to drive the turbo pumps, then feeding much higher pressure propellant into the combustion chamber to be burned. The thing is, the exhaust from the turbo pump is then simply dumped overboard. The Raptor, though, being a full flow stage combustion engine, is configured so that none of the propellant is discarded. Instead, they have two pre-burners that burn either fuel-rich for the methane side or oxygen-rich for the oxygen side. Those reactions generate the huge energy to spin the turbines, feeding everything into the main combustion chamber where they combine and react for the main show. If burned optimally, this means the engine achieves higher efficiency because you're not just dumping a bunch of it overboard. The main drawback, of course, is that the engine is much more complex. SpaceX has already had so much success here, given that this is the first full-flow staged combustion engine to ever fly. There were two similar engines using this design, the Soviet RD-270 running on hypergolic propellants that was engineered but never actually left the test stand, and the integrated powerhead demonstrated by Aerojet and Rocketdyne that was never actually tested as a full rocket engine. Anyway, back to Raptor, it seems that there are plenty more improvements to be made. Regardless, for its size, the Raptor 2 is the most powerful rocket engine ever made, and coming up next with Raptor 3, SpaceX wants to take it to the next level, simplifying the design further, improving the thrust, and making it even more reliable. Thanks again there to Callum for spending a bunch of time helping us to illustrate a lot of that. Do take a second to give him a follow there on X. He is doing some beautiful work, and supporting what he's doing will mean some great goodies like this dropping into your feed. Thanks as well for being here too, supporting and leaving such great comments. You'd be surprised, actually, how much of these videos are inspired by your very questions. You are, in fact, helping create the very videos that you are subscribed here to see.
Now before leaving the topic of rocket engines, this shot that SpaceX shared recently here demonstrates just how complex it is to control the beast. This is a Raptor vacuum engine being tested in slow motion just as it shuts down. At sea level, the atmospheric pressure is stronger than you may think. That's one kilogram per square centimetre, or just over 14 pounds per square inch. That is actually quite a lot of pressure, and as the engine shuts down, the exhaust pressure drops, and the atmosphere pushes in, creating this separation of the flow. The result is those beautiful rings, presumably adding colossal vibration to the structure. The fact that the engine bell is so wide for vacuum use is the very reason that the flow separation happens so easily here. When used in space, there is no such issue. Actually, it must have been the week for great engine footage, because Launcher shared one of their kerosene oxygen engine testing videos just the other day in beautiful 4K. This is their E2 engine, and it is mostly 3D printed. It is a much smaller engine for much smaller vehicles, but even still, it puts out a whopping 10 tons of thrust. Launcher, by the way, is now owned by Vast, just in case anyone missed that last year, and these are simply being made to supply companies that are needing engines for small launch vehicles. Right, so let's jump into the usual Falcon 9 launch action of the week. It is just amazing how routine the drone ships roll in and out these days, all due to the incredible reliability and fast turnaround of Falcon 9 launches. Just a week ago, remember, we had a Booster 1062 landing for the record 20th time, and some beautiful shots courtesy of Max with NSF, presenting this beautifully as it was transported back to the Cape on the drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas. This is the ultimate filthy booster. You can barely even tell tell that it was painted white at this stage. You have 20 layers of entry and landing burn soot there after all of its launch history starting in November of 2020. Now interestingly, it was actually chained to the drone ship instead of being held by the Octagrabber like SpaceX usually does with other Falcon 9s. Perhaps there were some rough seas needing it to be secured better. After all, it would have been very sad to lose this one like we did with the previous flight record holder Booster 1058 not so long ago. People kind of forget just how monstrous Falcon 9 is. Jerry Pike has a knack for picking up incredible examples of humans for scale such as these ones right here. Make sure you are following all of those accounts because they're always sharing great moments such as this. That, by the way, was the return of Booster 1083, having flown only twice. Hardly any sort on that one. Of course, we had the typical Starlink action, this one kicking off with Booster 1077 lifting off from Orange Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center. Another daylight mission heading into the sky on Wednesday late into the afternoon. 23 new Starlink satellites were tucked away within the fairings, and waiting downrange was just read the instructions to catch the beast touching down on landing number 12. Nearby at Cape Canaveral's Space Force Station a day later on Thursday afternoon, they were off again from Space Launch Complex 40. Booster 1080 soaring into the early evening sky and another 23 Starlink satellites on board. The signal quality was kind of the surprise on this one. The booster footage had cut out on entry before the landing burn and, as if by magic, it just appeared there on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas for its seventh landing. Just the two launches and landings this week, which somehow seemed like a quiet week for Falcon 9. Now you may recall I recently talked about NASA's proposed budget, but just this week they've released information specifically about the troubles being faced with the proposed Mars Sample Return mission. The latest review study said that the program would require at least $11 billion to be completed in the existing timeline, but somehow, to keep the budget limited to the original $5 to $7 billion, the mission wouldn't be possible until 2040. Um, 2040? I mean, NASA plans hope to have human boots on the Martian surface before then, so what would be the point? Bill Nelson said in a press conference this week that $11 billion is obviously too expensive, and not being able to return samples until 2040 is simply unacceptable. So where to from here? NASA doesn't want to leech budget and cannibalize other planetary missions to do that, obviously, which is great to see. We wouldn't want to lose a mission like Dragonfly, which will go to Titan, the Near Earth Object Surveyor Telescope, or Veritas, which is a Venus orbiter mission. In fact, at this point, it would probably be a good idea to just cancel the Mars sample return mission completely and simply send some of that funding over to save the Chandra Space Telescope. Anyway, to keep the Mars sample return mission alive as a final resort, NASA is seeking proposals from all NASA centers and private industry to seek interest in a new study. NASA is hoping that someone out there will have a plan or find a solution that will help keep the mission alive and return samples from Mars within the next decade. 
For now though, at least the program will be constrained to use very little budget for at least the next two years. Although NASA asked for around $900 million for the project for the 2024 fiscal year, they are for now restricting it to just a little over one third of that at $310 million. Should they even keep it ticking along at this point though, what do you think? Now this is kind of exciting, Boeing's Starliner has finally been rolled out to be stacked onto the Atlas V for their first crewed flight test coming up in just a few weeks. Greg Scott was on the scene picking up some terrific shots of it as it moved out in the early morning on Tuesday. Now this crewed flight test or CFT mission is absolutely critical for the future of Boeing's Starliner and their contracts with NASA's commercial crew program. NASA astronauts Butch, Wilmore and Sawney Williams will be on board piloting the Starliner to the International Space Station, hopefully launching on May the 6th, which could obviously slip if needed. Once at the station, they will stay on board for about eight days. They will then reboard Starliner for their journey back to Earth. So just as the sun rose, it was hooked up, ready to be raised, and a great time lapse of it there heading up to be stacked onto the Atlas V within ULA's vertical integration facility. Interestingly, if it launches on time, that is going to be almost exactly two years after the Starliner's second uncrewed flight test, OFT2, which successfully docked to the station and was returned. Now that wasn't without its challenges though, with two of its OMAC thrusters out of the 12 failing after ignition. So there is certainly more to improve on this flight. Anyway, now that it is stacked, in a few days they are planning to do the flight test readiness review, and then we should know if the schedule is going to hold. Now you may recall me recently mentioning that we are going to be attempting the first ever launch of a commercial orbital rocket built in Australia. Gilmore Space in Queensland, Australia has been all over the local news lately with new images of their Eris rocket rolling up to the launch tower at the new spaceport in Bowen. This spaceport was officially opened early this month in order to provide the launch pad for the first mission at Abbott Point on the coast there. Now this location is just 19.9 degrees south of the equator, making it quite advantageous for low inclination orbits. We should get a nice benefit from the Earth's rotation launching from here. In comparison, Cape Canaveral in Florida is about 28.4 degrees north, so yeah, from here we get some good opportunities. The three-stage Eris rocket, which is 23 meters or 75 feet tall, was lifted on the launch pad last week for testing as Gilmore Space continues pushing through the lead-up steps towards test flight one. Now just to put the scale into perspective, this is a little taller than Rocket Lab's Electron, which is about five meters shorter. Saying that, the payload to orbit seems to be pretty much identical around the 300 kilogram mark. So yeah, the capability is kind of similar for this first vehicle. Gilmore Space is using proprietary rocket engines on the vehicle, which we don't know a lot about. They use hybrid engines for the first and second stage, with the third stage using just liquid oxygen and kerosene. A hybrid engine is one that uses propellant that is a mixture of a solid material, typically a solid fuel such as a rubber mixture, along with either a gas or liquid for the oxidizer. That by the way typically makes the handling of the propellant less dangerous, and it also avoids a lot of the complexity needed in liquid rocket engines. Virgin Galactic uses a hybrid engine too by the way. A hybrid can be shut down easily and also have its thrust lowered, which is a benefit over typical solid rocket motors. If something fails, a hybrid rocket tends to do so less energetically because the propellants are in different phases of matter. The trade-off of course is that the specific impulse of the engine typically sits somewhere in between solid rocket motors and pure liquid propellant engines. Anyway, they are hoping for this to be lifting off next month, assuming that the launch approvals are granted, so we are really close now. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, the subscribe button is right down there. Thanks for supporting what we do. Next week, we actually have a fun deep dive coming up. So stay tuned for that. I can't wait to see what you think. In the meantime, consider checking out one of my other videos popping up here. As always, appreciate you watching all this way through and I will catch you for the next one.